Hi LEGO fans! It's time for another retro Harry Potter set review, and this spooky little hodgepodge is quite the rarity. Today we're revisiting Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and as this set is looking very clean, I'm going to skip the rebuild and get straight into the review. This is of course set number 4766, Graveyard Duel, from LEGO Harry Potter! Later in the video I'll be recreating the rise of he who must not be named in LEGO, but for now let's get on with it. Graveyard Duel came out in 2005, which was a lean year for LEGO Harry Potter sets. Other sets from 2005 include the awesome 4762 Escape from the Mer People, 4767 Harry and the Hungarian Horntail, and 476 the most impressive Durmstrang ship. This set retailed for 30 US dollars or 30 Great British Pounds and turned out to be a great investment. If you find one of these mint in box, it is worth hundreds, but you can find them used at around the $150 price mark. I got this set incomplete on eBay for $85, then had to hit Bricklink for a number of bits and pieces. Those included a replacement glow-in-the-dark head for he who shall not be named. Well, at least you could look grateful, Voldy. It's a 548-piece set and includes a number of standalone builds, which is a good reason why it's so hard to find one of these sets complete. The near 550 piece part count also includes 8 minifigures, of which 5 are exclusive to this set. We get a couple of white skeletons, which are pretty common and resell for around $2 a piece. There's also a much more exotic black skeleton with evil skull worth $13. This interesting sand green bony fellow is worth about $7, but then we get to the A-list characters. This is the HP 069A Voldemort with glow-in-the-dark head and jazzy cape. The glow-in-the-dark head is quite brittle and boosts his value to $31. Next we have a HP 071 Peter Pettigrew aka Wormtail and he's worth about $14. This is a HP 073A Death Eater which is clearly Lucius Malfoy in disguise. He's also quite rare and commands a used value of about $22. Finally we have the star of the show, a HP 074 Harry Potter who's worth about $11. It's quite the lineup of minifigures and accounts for about two thirds of the set's value. We'll take a close up look at each minifigure later in the video and compare them to their on screen counterparts. This set recreates the graveyard scene in which Voldemort is resurrected during Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The scene, set in Little Hangleton, culminates with Voldemort and the boy what Gondon lived dueling, but more on that later. The 2005 sets are themed on the Triwizard Tournament, which was founded in 1294. It's a friendly contest between Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Bobaton's Academy of Magic, and Durmstrang Institute. Part Vila, Fleur, aka Flem de la Cour, was the Bobaton's champion. Bulgarian national Quidditch team player Victor Crum represented the proud sons of Durmstrang, and Cedric Diggory was selected by the Goblet of Fire for Hogwarts. Harry being only 14 did not meet the minimum age requirement for this dangerous competition. His name was added by Bartimius Crouch Jr, who used Polyjuice Potion to substitute himself for Aura Alistair Mad-Eye Moody. The first task of capturing a golden egg from a dragon was captured in the 2005 wave of sets. LEGO also recreated the second task where Ron, Hermione Cho and Fleur's little sister Gabrielle Delacour were being held by the Mer people in the Dark Lake. Unfortunately for Fleur, the Grindelors proved too much and she had to retire. The final task, set in a large maze, was very much shortened in a movie which focused much more heavily on this pivotal scene. What Harry and Cedric found in the centre of the maze was not just the Triwizard Cup, it was a port key. A magical object enchanted to instantly bring anyone touching it to a specific location. In this case, Little Hangleton, the ancestral home of the Riddle family. The LEGO recreation of Little Hangleton Graveyard is quite sizeable, especially compared to the 75965 Rise of Voldemort set from 2019. It's not very faithful to the movie, but does include some recognisable features. For example, the crypt from which Wormtail emerges to kill the spare. The spare, as Cedric learned way too late, was him. Who are you? What do you want? Kill the spare! Avada Kedavra! Poor Cedric. The largest build from the set is this chapel, or maybe even a crypt. Outside we find a hinged wall, complete with garbage can, and somewhere to get water for floral tributes. I'm not certain what the sand green cones are for, but I guess they may be vases for cut flowers. Interestingly, the garbage can has a removable lid, just in case you want to do a spot of dumpster diving. I do have to question what kind of an operation they're running here. It's rather macabre to find body parts dumped in a bin. Also outside the Chapel of Horrors, we find some tools. There's a sweeping brush for tidying up mislaid limbs and a shovel for grave digging. 
The chapel itself is a really nice building. There's a pitched sand green roof and this is removable. Leading up to the entrance is an elegant set of stairs and inside an elegant tiled floor which hides another secret. This is removable and deep within the crypt we make a sinister discovery. Alarmingly, the occupants of the crypt seem to be missing some limbs. I definitely saw one of the green guy's arms and a leg in that trash can. This is actually really nicely constructed and I like the use of snot bricks to support the removable floor. It's a really cool little building but has some very macabre secrets given this was designed for kids. If you thought bodies buried under the floorboards was macabre then things are about to get gravely worse. I think this one must belong to Beethoven because I can hear him inside decomposing. If you're feeling particularly ghoulish you can open these up and reveal the inhabitants. It appears the body snatchers got here first because we only have half a cadaver. I really do like the school shaped gravestone which looks just like the occupant. It looks like the other grave may be occupied by Captain Redbeard. We've got this superb parrot element. The actual tombstone is a stickered part and made from this unusual modified 1x4x2 brick. There is some decorative foliage but I'm sure you want to see what's on the inside of the grave. This one pivots up revealing another skeleton. This poor chap must have been called Arthur. Now I look at these anorexic dudes a little closer, I see they're not actually half skeletons. The coffins have just rotted away revealing the occupants within. The next final resting place is a little bit more grand but I can't quite make out the name. Perched on top is a grey frog so I guess the occupant of the grave croaked. Clearly somebody is still tending to the grave and I love these old school Lego flowers. On the side we have something which looks like a lance for a minifigure knight. This hints at some kind of interactive function. So simple but very very effective. Now of course bodies can be heavy and carrying them is absolute murder. So we have this neat little cart to make life or death a little bit easier. At the front we have a handle for pulling and steering the cart. It sits on four rather splendid cartwheels which I remember from the original Castle series. The coffin is removable and it sounds like there might be some bones inside. Let's lift off the lid and prepare for a bad smell. Inside we find two arms and a leg which is pretty much what it costs to replace those black skeleton arms. These parts are rare to say the least and they cost me $4 each on Bricklink. I imagine they belong to the black skeleton from the crypt. He looks pretty scary but truth be told he's armless. I do like the little flap at the back which folds down allowing pallbearers to slide the coffin off the cart. There's also a seat at the front for a driver to steer the imaginary horses. Also included in the set we get this rather sinister tree. Sitting at the base we have the skeleton of a dedicated Lego fan who died waiting for their Lego shop at home order to arrive. The tree is crawling with wildlife including two spiders with their clicky fangs, three bats hanging upside down from the branches and a couple of black owls. Owl be back. If muggles needed any more incentive to stay out of Little Hangleton Graveyard, there's an impressive fence and set of gates. For added security, the gates are chained and padlocked. Check out that neat printed one by one tile. The gates have some really neat decoration. Norbert, is that you? The Black Dragons are exclusive to this set and I'm reminded that I should have bought one of these from Bricklink. There should be a matching dragon on the other side but I totally messed this up and you'll have to make do with a baby Groot. The two sections of fence on either side are slightly less elaborate but do the job. These are hinged and can be folded up to make a graveyard with a much smaller footprint. The biggest and most impressive feature of the graveyard is the burial plot belonging to the Riddle family. They were influential muggles who owned most of Little Hangleton. Surrounding the plot and keeping away the riffraff is a chain link fence. There are also some steps leading to the memorial and just a little bit of foliage to add to the cheery atmosphere. The grave itself is covered in vines and worryingly a snake seems to be making a break for it. The tombstone bears the single name Tom Riddle but this is not the Tom Riddle you're thinking of. There should actually be three names on the tombstone. Thomas Riddle 1880 to 1943, Mary Riddle his wife 1883 to 1943 and Tom Riddle Sr who lived from 1905 to 1943. The three of them were killed by Tom Marvolo Riddle aka Voldemort at the age of 16 in cold blood. The murder of Tom Riddle Sr was used to turn the gaunt ring into a horcrux. Perched on top of the gravestone we have the Angel of Death which did not qualify as one of the minifigures. It has a pair of black wings which are very similar to the ones we see on the Buckbeak figure. The Angel of Death comes with a creepy skeleton face and white hands but lacks the scythe we see in the movie. 
This was recreated way better in the later set. The hood is a nice element and gives us a very creepy look. Around the back of the grave we find a handle which hints at another action feature. Why does it always have to be snakes? Yes, we have green and red snakes inside the grave and I guess the green one could be Nagini. You may recall in the movie when Wormtail and Voldemort appear that a large cauldron bursts into flames. Lego of course did include that in the set even though I forgot to include it in the opening sequence. This is where, if you excuse the pun, the magic happens. The cauldron sits on a rudimentary fire with trans orange elements representing the flames. Inside we find a bunch of trans clear, red and yellow studs but no baby Voldemort. Now before we start the resurrection, how did we come to the moment where it was necessary to chuck a naked baby Voldemort into a boiling cauldron? Back in 1981, Voldemort was intent on killing the Potters. Lily threw herself in front of Harry, imparting sacrificial protection. This caused Voldemort's curse to rebound, ripping Voldemort's soul apart and leaving him a ghostly form with no body. After a decade of barely existing, Voldemort happened upon the hapless Quirinus Quirrell in 1991. He latched onto Quirrell's body and forced him to prey on unicorns so that he could drink their blood and gain strength. He was hoping to use Flamel's Philosopher's Stone, but you know how that ended. Voldemort reconnected with Peter Pettigrew in 1994 near a forest where Voldemort was hiding. Pettigrew helped him build a rudimentary body strengthened by a potion of unicorn blood and venom from Nagini, a snake he befriended. With a little help from Barty Crouch Jr, Harry was forced into the Triwizard Tournament and eventually ended up here in Little Hangleton. It looks like it's showtime, Wormtail. Bone of the father unknowingly given, you will renew your son. The bone of course is taken from the grave of Tom Riddle's father. Flesh of the servant, willingly sacrificed, you will revive your master. Blood of the enemy, forcibly taken, you will resurrect your foe. And then in a kind of hideous rebirth sequence, Voldemort is resurrected to his true form. Without so much as a thank you, Voldemort uses a tattoo on Peter Pettigrew's arm to summon his Death Eaters. For the purposes of this set, only one of the Death Eaters showed up, Lucius Malfoy. After ripping away Lucius Malfoy's mask and berating him, Voldemort takes pity on Pettigrew and gives him a new shiny magic hand. The Lego version isn't nearly as impressive, but at least they made the effort. After a rambling monologue and making Harry bow before him, Voldemort announces it's time to duel. Unfortunately for Harry, Voldemort is intent on killing him, and as he eloquently puts it, I want to see the light leave your eyes. After some resistance, Harry realises this can only end one way. In a very ballsy move, he decides to use the spell Expelliarmus against Voldemort's killing curse. What Voldy hasn't yet realised is that both of their wands have the same core. This duel will not end out the way Voldemort wants it. I guess at this point we should mention Priory Incantatum. It's a magical phenomenon that occurs when two wands sharing the same source for their cores are forced to compete in combat. It's often referred to as the reverse spell effect for good reason. When one of the wands has been used to cast the killing curse, the victims reappear in ghost-like form and can communicate with nearby living beings. A nice little earner if you happen to go and get yourself killed in the first movie. Voldemort's wand most recently killed Cedric Diggory and Frank Bryce the Muggle caretaker and gardener at the old Riddle Manor. Lily and James Potter also showed up to help Harry escape. After breaking the streams, Harry makes a break for it, grabs Cedric's body and touches the port key. Boom, they're back in the grounds of Hogwarts and Cedric is no more. My boy! This is definitely one of the darker moments in Harry Potter and the resulting Lego set is quite macabre. It also comes with a rather nice and rather valuable selection of minifigures. We've got a pair of white skeletons, a black skeleton, a sand green skeleton with black legs and head, a HP 069 Lord Voldemort, HP 073 Death Eater, HP 071 Peter Pettigrew, and HP 074 Harry Potter. The least exciting and least valuable minifigure from the set is the GEN004 Skeleton with Evil Skull. These guys are worth about $2 and first appeared in the Adventurers theme. The set is reported as having two of these, but the second one doesn't come with real legs. The face is printed with the Evil Skull design, which has since been replaced with a more friendly version. The torso is a brilliant Lego piece, and I love the ribs and the detail in the spine. Also cool are the wibbly wobbly arms. The legs are attached independently and have some really nice detail for the toes. Much easier to see against a white background is the GEN013 Black Skeleton with Evil Skull. This is exclusive to the set and worth about $13 used. 
We've got the same evil school design, this time with white ink printed on black Lego, nicely sculpted torso piece complete with wibbly wobbly arms, and a pair of black legs. This colour makes it slightly easier to see the toe detail. The third skeleton is the GEN014 variant with sand green body and arms and black legs and head. It is exclusive to this set, but the parts are available in others and therefore it's worth about $7 used. It has the same evil school design which gives me the heebie-jeebies, and an unusual sand green torso with sand green arms. These are also used in the HP046 Dementor, hence the lower value. Complementing the head, the legs come in the same black colour as the previous skeleton. Moving on to the real minifigures, this is Wormtail, aka Scabbers, aka Peter Pettigrew, Order of Merlin First Class. Peter first appeared as a minifigure in set number 4756, Shrieking Shack. It's a really cool set and you'll find a review on my channel. He also appeared in The Rise of Voldemort in 2019 where LEGO did a much better job with the costume. Peter was best friends with Sirius Black, James Potter and Remus Lupin and together they created the Marauders map. Starting at the bottom we have dark grey legs which are not very exciting. The torso is exclusive, helping to boost the minifigure's value to about $14. The printed design, however, is taken from the 2004 Shrieking Shack set and does not match Wormtail's costume as seen during the resurrection at Little Hangleton. As was common around this time in 2005, we don't have any printing on the back of the torso. Peter does, however, have a dark grey hand representing the magical hand gifted to him by Voldemort after he sliced off his own appendage. The face does bear some resemblance to Wormtail and has those rat-like teeth. I'm less sure about the ginger moustache, which I don't recall seeing Timothy Spall wearing in the movie. I always like to compare these minifigures to the counterpart characters in the movie. As you can see here, Wormtail's costume is completely different and the facial features are a little bit questionable. With all that said, the HP071 Wormtail minifigure is not a terrible thing considering it was released in 2005. Next we have the HP073A Death Eater, the second most valuable minifigure from the set at around $22. Another version of the Death Eater minifigure appeared in the 5378 Hogwarts Castle in 2007, and there was also a Death Eater in 2019's The Rise of Voldemort. This version of the Death Eater wears a rather raggedy cape which matches what Voldemort wears. It doesn't really do a very good job of representing the Death Eater's robes. Hiding underneath we have the same dark grey legs we saw on Wormtail. The torso print is exclusive to the minifigure and shows Lucius Malfoy's pinstripe suit, shirt, tie and vest. The Death Eater may be wearing a mask but the hair totally gives him away as Lucius Malfoy. It's a particularly detailed print of the Death Eater's mask and I love the use of metallic silver here. To play out the scene where Voldemort removes Malfoy's mask, we actually have an alternate expression which does a pretty good job of recreating the Malfoy sneer. As you might notice from the whites of the eyes, LEGO wasn't very good at printing these heads in 2005. The final detail to point out is Lucius's very impressive long blonde hair. I bet he uses L'Oreal. In terms of the costume, the HP073 Death Eater doesn't really represent what we saw in the movie. Again, I don't think this is the best minifigure in the world, but it is a reasonably good addition to this set. Of course we can't have a set recreating the resurrection of Voldemort without he who must not be named. This is the HP069 minifigure and is the first time Voldemort appears in a Lego set. Well I guess you could count Quirrellmort but that's an argument for another day. The raggedy cape is the same one that we got with the Death Eater and looks nothing like Voldemort's black robes. Removing the cape reveals a rather boring minifigure. The plain black legs are a very generic part and the only notable feature about the plain black torso is those white hands. The most notable features can be found on the head. Firstly, you'll notice that Voldemort is a funny colour, and we'll come back to that. Secondly, you'll notice he's got a nose, which of course minifigures never have. Another interesting thing about minifigures from this era is that they have an air hole in the head. For some reason, LEGO's designers decided that Voldemort should glow in the dark. Well, why not? Comparing the Voldemort minifigure to the character in the movie, this really doesn't do it for me. The head is actually pretty good, but we lose the elegance of the long flowing black robes. It's also a shame that we didn't get a baby Voldemort like we did in the 2019 set. And finally we have the boy what gone done lived, it's Harry Potter! This is the HP074 version wearing his Triwizard Tournament panelled shirt. We got a very similar figure in the 2019 Rise of Voldemort set. The later figure definitely looks a little bit more like the character in the movie. This version has the full-size black minifigure legs rather than the shorter movable ones. 
The torso does a really good job of recreating what Harry was wearing during the final task. I like the way two differently coloured arms have been coordinated to match the jersey. I'm also appreciative of the metallic gold printing used to create the Hogwarts crest. Not only that, we have some really nice printing on the back of the torso. It's great to see Potter and the star picked out in metallic gold. The facial print seems to be the same design they used on all of the early LEGO Harry Potter minifigures. We've got his trademark glasses and lightning shaped scar which isn't quite in the right place. The hair is a pretty good choice for the young Harry Potter, but by the goblet of fire he'd grown his hair and gone all trendy. The 2019 minifigure definitely represents this better. Apart from the hair, this is a pretty good likeness to the character in the movie. LEGO did a great job with the sweater and you can't go wrong with black strides. With a resale value of about $11, this is not the most valuable minifigure from the set, but I do think it is the most screen accurate. This may not be the most accomplished set of minifigures to ever come with the LEGO set, but it was nice to get some exclusive skeletons, some relatively rare characters, and for the first time, a Lord Voldemort. I'm not sure what the glow in the dark feature is all about, but it is a pretty cool gimmick. So that was the epic and very macabre 4766 Graveyard Jewel from LEGO Harry Potter. Groot, what did I tell you? Sorry about that. This is a fantastically sprawling set with lots of bits of pieces that shouldn't really work together but actually do. It's quite different to the 2019 version which was much more compact. What this set does bring is lots of personality and more than a smidge of horror. I mean there's body parts dumped in the trash can and skeletons left open to the elements. It's no wonder the tree's infested with vermin. I really enjoyed the hidden features like the pop-up skeleton and the grisly secrets hidden within the coffins. Best of all, you have pretty much everything you need to recreate an iconic scene from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I really enjoyed getting to poke around Little Hangleton Graveyard and murdering Cedric one more time. My boy! I hope you enjoyed this classic Harry Potter set review as much as I did making it. If you did, a thumbs up is always appreciated and don't forget to subscribe for more awesome LEGO Harry Potter content. Thanks a million for checking out today's review, stay safe and I'll see you on the next build video.